Those are the first four notes of the piano part of this next masterpiece, Quartet for the End of Time. And if it sounded a little unusual, uh, maybe even um, to the first listen as being off key, um, that's a part of this masterpiece. Uh, definitely sounds different than the classical music that I'm used to hearing, but yet, um, uh, written by one of the what, what is understood to be or believed to be or debatably um, to be one of the better composers of the 20th century uh, Frenchman by the name of Olivier Messiaen and this it's part of the Quartet for the End of Time which is a classical music composition he did in 1941 um, and this is our 51st masterpiece um, to me, it's the music isn't as impressive as the setting in which it was written and performed. Um, he was a prisoner of war during World War II in a, in a Nazi prisoner of war camp. And there was uh, a German guard who was uh, familiar with his music. And so he actually went out of his way to give Messiaen space to compose. And Messiaen actually wrote this quartet, the Quartet for the End of Time, which is based on Revelation chapter 10. Um, and the, the seven angels um, that, and um, the quote or the scripture verse uh, part of chapter 10, where it's, there's no more time. And um, so he actually, the, the first performance was in front of the prisoners, the guards, in a small group in the middle of winter in 1941 in the, uh, I believe the name of the camp was Gorlitz in Gorlitz, Germany, um, in Barracks 27. He wrote the music for four instruments because they were the only four instruments that they had available. A cello with only three strings, a clarinet, a violin, and a piano. That one was dilapidated, but, um, and of course, uh, for our author, Terry Glasby, for the 75 masterpieces, he thinks it ends up being a masterpiece. Um, so, they, uh, a little bit more about the uh, composition. The, um, the title, again, comes from the proclamation of the seventh angel from Revelation 10 about the time when all will be made right in eternity, a time, a time beyond time. Um, he ins Messiaen inscribed in his notes to the score in the homage to the angel of the apocalypse who lifts his hand toward heaven, saying there shall no longer, there shall be time no longer. And of course, in that setting, um, many people thought that the World War II could have been the end of time. Um, but they do say that... Um, Messiaen wasn't trying to write some, you know, kind of dismal music that would kind of accompany or maybe what some would be seem appropriate for a prison camp in the middle of World War II in the winter. But he tried to create something that was um, hopeful. They say this, hope does not sound like a sweeping romantic wash of strings. Instead, Messiaen's rhythms dance along in intricate patterns without any regular beat to ground them. There are moments of clashing chords jostling against each other as well as long sections of great contemplative serenity called louinges or songs of praise. So it starts with the, uh, a movement called the Liturgy of Crystal. Then uh, two later movements celebrate the immortality and e eternal life of Christ. Then one movement highlights the voice of the archangel with a swirling and cascading piano. It is playfully titled A Tangle of Rainbows. Then there is also the Dance of Fury in which all the instruments join together in discordant musical loops of sound. Um, and all the quartet contains eight movements, seven representing the seven days of creation, the, an eighth for the eternal life that follows. Um, so they kind of say they, that this, along with Met, all of Messiaen's work, uh, sets aside the musical conventions of Western classical music, kind of makes a... a um, you know, and that he was similar to many, all modern composers. They're not as worried about linear progression, development, or har harmonic resolution. Um, and because of that, they can sound strange to the casual listener because we're more used to that. It's a music of contrasts. 
comes sometimes funerally slow and contemplative, sometimes nervous and jarring, sometimes voluptuous and grand, sometimes peaceful and spare, always interesting. So, um, yeah, kind of fascinating. Never had heard of this before. And so some a little bit about Messien, he actually was born to two atheist parents. But at a young age, uh, somehow, and I didn't read, it didn't say it in this chapter, but he, he, he uh, wanted to become Catholic. So he became Christian and Catholic. And um, he studied at the, uh, he, he had special interest in two uh, composers of the time, Claude Debussy and Maurice Ravel. Um, it says their colorful impressionistic compositions fascinated him. He began to compose music himself, even at a young age, started asking for <laughs> gifts for Christmas that, uh, for composition sheets. Um, and again, even though his parents weren't even Christians. Um, so he started at the Paris Conservatory at the age of 11. He became a star pupil, um, started playing the organ, showed a, you know, a great uh, ability to play that. He was a child prodigy in music, really. Um, and then in 1931, marked two milestones in his life. Again, so he would have been 23 years old. He, his first public performance of one of his own compositions, and he was appointed an organist at a church in Paris, Saint Trinité, that he would serve there as an organist throughout for the rest of his life. Um, so they kind of say he was always experimenting with sounds, trying to do different things. And the summary of his influences I thought was very interesting. Messian's influences were many and varied, including the music of India, Indonesia, Japan, ancient Greece, medieval chant, polyphonic songs, the Impressionism of Debussy and Ravel, and avant-garde modernism. Um, so he says he maintained that music should be interesting, beautiful to listen to, and must touch the heart of the listener. So it kind of says for those who take the time to accustom themselves to his unique palette of sounds, textures, and rhythms will find his work accomplishes all these goals. So, um, and they really go on to say he was kind of an amateur theologian. He, he would say when uh, talking about his music, I wish to express the marvelous aspects of the faith. I'm not saying that I've succeeded from the fi final analysis, they're inexpressible. Most of the arts are unsuited to the expression of religious truths. Only music, the most immaterial of all, comes close to it. So that was kind of his idea there. And when it came to his Catholic faith, he would say, the first idea I want to express, the most important, is the existence of the truths of the Catholic faith. The illumination of the theological truths of the Catholic faith is the first aspect of my work, the noblest and no doubt the most useful and most valuable, perhaps the only one I won't regret at the hour of my death. So a great Catholic musician. Um, and so check out, again, I hadn't heard it before, and I listened to some of it, the quartet for the end of time, but really fascinating in this modern music idea, still representing faith. They say that he was kind of looked down upon even as he taught uh, at, back at that observatory that he, that he learned in, um, in Paris, that he was looked kind of down upon by many of the academics and the teachers because most of them, you know, clearly saw that you could not be an intellectual or one who appreciated the arts and be a person of faith. So he was unique, but he continued to be heroic in that way and still obviously was able to have earned respect of the musical world because of his still skill and his talent. So uh, that's the number 51. Thank you for joining me. The next time we will go into number 52, Four Quartets by T.S. Eliot. Those are poems from 1943. So thanks again. Have a great day and God bless.